Hello, this is Upon This Rock. It's a midweek Bible study from Solid Rock in Drogheda, midweek online Bible study. And I'm so glad that you've decided to join us for tonight's study. Uh, we do this every Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. And uh, we're doing a, a verse by verse study of Mark's gospel. This is not the first book we've done this with. We've covered a few other books of the Bible, but we're working our way through Mark's gospel. Now, before we get into the study, Janice is going to lead us in a worship song. So I invite you to worship along with Janice and then we'll come back to the study of the word of God. chapter 14 and we're taking it verse by verse we don't skip out difficult parts we we look we we uh really try to get a full understanding of what the lord is saying and for a few weeks now we've been on mark chapter 14 because it's it's a long chapter so i mean 72 verses long um but we're going to finish off mark 14 uh tonight we're getting closer and closer uh to the death and the resurrection of jesus as mark records it but uh, we finished our last episode, episode 35. We finished that with, uh, with Jesus being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So now we join it again at Mark chapter 14 and verse 53. It says, They took Jesus to the high priest. All the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. And Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and there he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Now, Peter is no coward. He's, they all fled. 
he fled, all the disciples fled whenever Jesus was arrested. But he's not getting away as fast as he can. He's not hiding on the other side of Jerusalem. He's following from a distance and he goes right into the courtyard of the high priest. So Peter, you know, sometimes people are so quick because he denied Jesus at this time. People are so quick to label him a coward, but he's he's still going into the lion's den, so to speak. And uh, he's gone now from... Uh, Gethsemane to Gabbatha. The Gabbatha was a Hebrew word that meant the elevated place. Uh, its Greek name was Lithostrotos, which is the paved place. Uh, so it was like a, a paved patio, if you like, that was a bit raised from the ground and was used as a place of judgment. And Peter followed at a distance, frightened, obviously frightened, but longing to be a hero and desperately seeking not to fulfill what Jesus had said about denying him. Verse 30, uh, verse 55. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. The Sanhedrin were a body of 70 uh people uh, who uh, we believe from what Paul wrote that Paul was one of the Sanhedrin and we don't know if he was at this time or whether he came on the Sanhedrin at a later point in time so we, he certainly doesn't mention at any point that he was among the 70 that sentenced Jesus to death but also it's quite possible that sometimes the Sanhedrin would meet without all of the members being there you know, if you got you got a you got a board of seventy people. I mean, I, I know I I work on church boards with five people, eight people. I'm, I'm I'm on a council for the Church of God with eighteen people, and even then, there's sometimes people off sick and people missing for whatever reason or another. So it's unlikely all seventy would have been there. But uh, Paul certainly doesn't mention that he was there on this occasion. But he does say that on other occasions he sent he gave assent to Christians being put to death, but not here with Jesus. So this is quite a crowd. I mean, you've got the Sanhedrin, you've got the high priests, you know, you've got a big crowd. You've, you've got the, 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 the armed force of 300 to 600 soldiers that had brought Jesus there. So this place is packed. It's just heaving with people. And then they try to, they try to convict Jesus so that they could put him to death. Now, they got it all back to front. Because the way you're supposed to conduct a trial is you're supposed to um, you're supposed to have evidence, and then on the basis of, of evidence, you're supposed to reach a verdict, and then you're supposed to pass the sentence. They're starting with the sentence. They're starting with, before there's been any evidence and before there's been a verdict. They've already got the they've already got the sentence that they want, and that's the death penalty. And so then they work back from that. And they begin to invent some flimsy, false evidence, as, as we can see. So their statements did not agree. Verses 57, 58 and 59. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands. And in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. So they're, they're contradicting one another as they give this testimony. And we know that what they're saying is false. Now, Jesus had spoken something about, you know, if they, you know, tear this temple down and I will build it again in three days, speaking about his body. But all this about, I will destroy the temple made with human hands and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. We don't see that anywhere in the Gospels. That's a total invention. So, they're making things up. And you know, when people make things up and tell lies, they often disagree. Their words are garbled. They contradict one another. They misquoted Jesus and deliberately misunderstood what he had been saying, even if they'd quoted him directly. Verse 60, then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Now, the high priest knows that the evidence is bogus. If the evidence had been good, there would have been no need for him to ask for a confession. The evidence would have been sufficient to convict Jesus. 
But even in this one-sided, twisted kangaroo court, even the chief pre high priest knows that this evidence is not good enough to get a conviction. And so he tries to go for a confession instead. But Jesus doesn't even dignify the false accusations with an, with an answer. He's not going to try. And I mean, Jesus, you know, we've seen Jesus before when he's put on the spot. He's come up brought amazing wisdom and known what to say. But Jesus is not trying to wriggle out of a conviction here. He already knows how this must end. He already knows he's to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And he's not going to plead with them for anything dif different. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. I remember sat in it when I was at the Bible school. I remember a lecturer saying, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. And I says, well, what about Mark 14, 62? It's, he says, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And this is an amazing thing that Jesus is saying. He's not only saying, yes, I am the Messiah, knowing that in saying that, he's signing his own death sentence. But he's also saying this. He's saying, you think you're judging me. But the day is coming when I will judge you because he is going to return in judgment. Just think about that. They thought they were judging Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what, guys, one day I'm, I'm going to judge you. And yes, I am the Messiah. Verse 63. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? This man is a total hypocrite. Tearing your garments when you heard blasphemy was supposed to be a sign of grief, that you respected the name of God. And when you heard the name of God being blasphemed, you were so grief-stricken, you tore your clothes, which is something you did when somebody had died or you were grief-stricken. But this man is not tearing his clothes in grief. He's tearing his clothes in exultation. He's delighted. He's saying, we've got him. We've got a confession. But they haven't caught out Jesus. They've not got him. He has willingly handed himself towards the death sentence. He's willingly embraced his divine purpose. Verse 64 goes on to say, They all condemned him as worthy of death, and then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy, and the guards took him and beat him. They're torturing him, torturing him not to get a confession because they've already got the confession. They're just torturing him out of pure badness and evil, torturing him just for the sake of it. They accused Jesus of blasphemy. But what could be more blasphemous than what was taking place now? They're spitting in the face of God. They strike God with their fists. They mock him and they beat him. What could be a greater blasphemy than that? And there's a wonderful truth here if we would just take time to notice it. And it's this. There are some religions that get really outraged when they feel their prophet or their god has been blasphemed against and they're ready to kill other people. But our god was ready to submit to blasphemy in order to die for us. Blasphemy is not a crime for which Christians want to kill others. It's the means by which God himself dies for us. And that's why we shouldn't hate other people, even if they blaspheme against God, because the ultimate blasphemy has already taken place. And God took the ultimate blasphemy and used it to bring about our salvation, because you can't get anything more blasphemous than torturing and beating and crucifying God himself. Verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. Now Peter's testing begins. He's been warned twice 
by Jesus. But each time he's insisted, Lord, I will not, I will not deny you. Everyone else might, I won't. Verse 68, but he denied it. He denies it once. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. And when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. Do you see how the second denial follows the first denial so quickly? And this is how temptation operates. You know, sometimes we like to think what we would do in this circumstance, that after that first denial, I would, I would catch on to myself and I would say, I want to make sure that doesn't happen again. There's no time for that. Before, before Peter even has time to think through the implications that he's just denied Jesus, he's being uh, confronted again and he denies him a second time. Satan presses in, gives Peter no time to reflect. Satan presses in to his advantage to try to destroy Peter. And after a little while, those standing near to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. So the third denial follows shortly afterwards the first two denials. It appears that Peter has completely forgotten what Jesus had said. And then the rooster crowed and he realized and he wept. Look, it was, it was going to happen. Jesus wasn't making a false prophecy about Peter. It was going to happen. And Peter must have felt more ashamed than he had ever felt in his life. But actually, he was learning a lesson about his own frailty and his need to rely on God. And that brings us to the end of Mark chapter 14. So uh, we've got next week, we're going to continue into Mark chapter 15. There's another judgment to come now in front of Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And this, this was the Jewish religious authorities, the trial before them. Now there's a trial to come before the Roman governor. And that's where we'll join it again next week. So again, same time, same place. Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. here in my study. I do hope you'll join us again next week. And until then, stay blessed in Jesus' name. God bless you.